Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This time around, we're going to take a look at Simpson's Paradox. This edition, I think, really represents the first purely topical episode here on Quant Slob. If you're interested, I suggest you check out our foundational series. We just wrapped it up. I playlisted the entire series for your enjoyment and convenience. Simpson's Paradox is named after A1 Edward Hughes Simpson, uh, who is otherwise known as having served as a British codebreaker or crypt analyst during World War II. Not to be confused with Thomas Simpson, uh, who was around about uh, two centuries prior and who is known for his super cool Simpson's rule or Simpson's approximation. Sometimes when I, I look at a picture of a historical figure, I try to imagine what it would be like to hang out with the person. I ask myself, um, if the party keg was running low, would this person offer to make a keg run? And uh, based on a picture, I know that this is highly unscientific, but it's sort of amusing, and sometimes amusement is more important than science. And I'll tell you for sure, this uh, Edward Simpson character is definitely throwing off a vibe here in this picture, and I'm not sure if uh, this guy would volunteer to hop in his dually and make a keg run. Maybe he would. I don't know that for sure. But I definitely got him pegged as offering to chip in. And of course, as we all know, that's the next best thing. Moving on. Uh, most introductory examples we'll see illustrating Simpson's paradox involve a three-factor setup. What we're going to do here in this edition is demonstrate how to fashion an example of a three-factor paradox. In other words, we're going to simulate results to illustrate Simpson's paradox. Then we're going to discuss how such an unusual thing can possibly be. We start by imagining a population of 210 coin tosses. And there's a lot of ways to do this, okay? This is just an example. We ascribe three categorical attributes or factors, each of these with two categories. You can see which hand was used to toss the coin, left, right, which of two coins were used, coin A or coin B, and lastly, the outcome of the flip, heads, tails. We're going to create a two by two table to show the distribution of the proportion of heads given the other two factors, which hand was used and which coin was flipped. The number of flips in our population is 210. To start our simulation, this particular example, we're going to select a number that's a little less than half of 210. So we'll choose 100. It's a nice, easy number to work with. And we're going to enter this number on a diagonal here. And what we're saying here is that coin A was flipped with the left hand 100 times and coin B was flipped with the right hand 100 times. For the upper left, we're going to say that half the flips came up heads, say 50, 50 heads. And we'll have the lower right be a ratio that's a little less than one half. We'll say 48, but it could 45 would work here too. We have 10 flips whose outcomes have not been described in the table here. Um, we'll split this in half and enter fives here on the other diagonal. Uh, for coin A now, what we're looking for here is a numerator that makes the right hand proportion of heads a little greater than that of the left hand. For coin B, we want a numerator that makes the left hand proportion of heads a little less than that of the right hand. So here we go. Three-fifths and two-fifths does the trick, respectively. Uh, it completes the paradox. And so we arrive at a situation where we can see here that left-handed flips yielded a higher ratio of heads than right-handed flips. Uh, 52 over 105 is greater than 51 over 105. However, for both coin A and coin B, the opposite is true. For both coin A and coin B, right-hand flips, not left-hand flips, produced a higher ratio of heads. Three-fifths is greater than 50 over 100, and 48 one-hundredths is greater than two-fifths. And I want to point out an interesting property of this particular simulation. Notice that the two marginal distributions are uniform. Okay, what do I mean? The number of left-hand flips is the same as right-hand flips, 105. We can see that here. Uh, the number of flips of coin A is the same as coin B. It's not shown, but uh, they're both 105 if you just sum up the numbers in the columns. So what do we make of all this? Um, the result we simulated here appears almost contradictory. Of course, it cannot be a contradiction because within the hallowed halls of math and formal logic, there is no such thing as a true contradiction. Formal logic, I'm not talking about dialectic logic or a so-called logic of inconsistency or any of their ilk. Okay, so it's not a contradiction, but the result certainly seems paradoxical. When discussing this topic, many sources draw attention to what could be viewed as a modeling problem. 
That is the omission of variables or covariates, usually with some moderating effect on the three factors we're examining. This is always an important consideration, but what I want to offer is a much more rudimentary and frankly mundane explanation from a purely arithmetic perspective. And once we see it, it kind of spoils the mystery. Simply said, the value of a ratio is nonlinear with respect to the denominator. The ratio three-fifths we use describes one more head's outcome than two-fifths, three, two. The ratio 51 hundredths describes two more head's outcomes than 48 one hundredths, 50, 48. However, the difference between three-fifths and two-fifths is 10 times greater than the difference between 51 hundredths and 48 one hundredths. And there we have it. Uh, if it should please you, it would please me greatly. There's a little subscribe button down there. I'd appreciate it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome, all of you great, big, beautiful Quant Slobbers. i got to start this edition by asking, is there anything that conveys the sheer grandeur of this channel better than having that big Quant Slob right there pop out of your screen coming at you like that at the beginning of every edition? I mean, it's, look at that. It gives me goosebumps. Uh, I'm sure you can tell I'm feeling it right now. This time around, we're going to kick off our basic application series. We just wrapped up our Quant Slob Foundational series. Um, and since there's no better way to know where you're going than to visit where you've been, uh, so a super speedy recap. Uh, we covered a ton of ground in the Foundational series, all the way from a discussion on how to approach scientific problem solving to statistical populations to an introduction uh, to terminology and symbology. And we closed things out with a big time discussion on probability and we covered a lot more topics uh, along the way through the whole thing. If you haven't already, uh, and if you're really interested in familiarizing yourself with stats and data science from the ground up, I strongly suggest you check out the foundational series. The series has been playlisted, uh, and I think the entire playlist runtime is well less than an hour and a half. Another reason for uh, checking out the foundational series is that we're going to make use of some of the examples and setups in future installments. Many people think of stats as one volume after another of methods, equations, techniques. And for this reason, it may surprise a lot of people that learning the art of statistics really involves a fairly modest handful of conceptual milestones. Understanding statistical populations is big. Probability, sampling distributions, continuous attributes or variables and their distributions, statistical tests, that is testing an assumption. Uh, for example, comparing an observation uh, or experience against a sampling distribution, just as an example. This idea of testing or comparing assumptions with uh, observations plays out throughout science. Uh, whether we are experimental designers charged with uh, the responsibility of determining whether a bolt making machine is working properly, or we're AI engineers building a reinforced learning uh, algorithm for a robot, the basic idea is the same. Now, uh, the face of these concepts may uh, be a little varied from one application to another. Uh, for example, an AI we may use, or the robot may use an empiric distribution of past robot behaviors rather than a probability sampling distribution. The idea is the same. Where are we headed? probability sampling distributions. And I want to say as a heads up, with probability sampling distributions, we're not going to discuss or spend a whole lot of time with how they're calculated. We're saving that for later. Plenty of time for that later. We're going to focus on something much more important. Uh, we're going to clarify uh, what they represent, and we're going to focus on looking for patterns in their shape, distribution, and variability. Um, hypothesis tests, uh, statistical tests of parameters, including some examples of applied hypothesis tests. That is going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is the second in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to kick off our mini series on probability sampling distributions. And we're going to pick up basically where we left off in our foundational series with our discussion on probability. And it shouldn't be much of a surprise to anybody, hopefully, that our first order of business here is to be very clear on the difference between a theoretical random sample and what could be meant by the term random sample. So we've got to be careful with terminology here. If you recall, a theoretical random sample refers to a purely imaginary activity. A theoretical random sample implicates, so to say, random variables from the fixed attribute values of a population's elements. 
On the other hand, of course, the term random sample can simply refer to an actual sample. For example, the four of clubs here could be a random sample of size one from a standard deck of cards. So let's uh, return to our trusty population of 52 cards. We know our distribution of the suit attribute values in the population. As we did previously, we're going to draw a theoretical random sample of one card. We think of this card as a purely imaginary or theoretical undertaking. We never actually select a card because if we did, there would be no probability associated with that activity because the card we select would simply be the card we select. The card, whatever card we select, would occur with certainty. So this is here the probability sampling distribution of our suit value uh, in our theoretical random sample of size one. Uh, this is sort of where we left off in our foundational series finale, but it's good to revisit. And uh, what comes next involves a bit of a leap. We're going to transform or translate this sampling distribution into something of more direct practical value. We're going to create a sample statistic, namely the number of cards suited as clubs in this theoretical random sample of size one. RV here stands for random variable, random variable. So what we're showing here is the probability sampling distribution of our sample statistic number of clubs in our theoretical sample of size one. In other words, the probability that one card in our sample of one is clubs is one fourth. The probability that none or zero of the one card is clubs is three fourths. So we've come this far. We may as well take it all the way. We can easily convert the sample number of clubs into sample proportion of clubs. We accomplish this simply by dividing by the sample size. In this case, the sample size is one, so this is quite easy to deal with. In addition to the table, by the way, um, here's a nice way to show the distribution of discrete quantities. Notice that this graph is similar to the bar charts uh, we looked at earlier that are commonly used for categories, but the bars are much narrower, and uh, here they're given the same color. This uh, makes the appearance of the plot, which shows a distribution of a quantity distinctive from bar charts, which are used to show the distribution of categories within a categorical variable or uh, factor. Uh, if we reflect back and do a little uh, bookkeeping, uh, we realize we've made uh, really good buddies with our friend the proportion here. Earlier in the foundational series, we learned about the proportion as a population parameter for a categorical variable or factor. Then we looked at the symbol, at least, for the proportion of a categorical variable in a sample. And just now, we've introduced a proportion as a random variable. So a sample proportion of cards suited as clubs in a sample of one is pretty easy to deal with. What about sample sizes greater than one? And this is where we're going to pick up in part two of this mini-series on sampling distributions. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Dearly appreciated. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is third in our basic application series. This time around, part two in our mini series on probability sampling distributions. We're going to pick up with our trusty deck of 52 cards. Let's imagine a theoretical random sample of two cards from our standard deck of playing cards. For this example, we're going to say that the two cards must be unique. Our theoretical random sample cannot contain the same card twice. I want to point out that our foundational series provides us with a very flexible toolkit. We have an alternate but entirely equivalent way of imagining this theoretical random sample of size two. We simply imagine a population that contains every possible ordered pair of cards. So for example, this population contains the element queen of spades, then the jack of diamonds. If you play pinochle, you might appreciate this element. It also contains, for example, the ten of diamonds, uh, then the ace of clubs here. It also contains, for example, the jack of diamonds, then the queen of spades here. Uh, it uh, just so happens uh, that uh, this population contains 2,652 elements. Uh, and by the way, to tie together what we've learned here, uh, this population, the way we're thinking about it, is essentially imaginary. Uh, but uh, there's nothing stopping us um, that uh, you know we could create, if we wanted to, uh, a population, uh, this population as a concrete population, like if we worked in a card factory and had access to lots of decks of playing cards, and a lot of free time. I don't know why we would uh, do such a thing, but, uh, but we certainly could. So uh, moving forward, uh, 
Here is our probability sampling distribution of sample proportion of clubs in a theoretical sample of size 2. Notice the vertical line on the plot, which marks a value of 1 quarter. This is the population proportion of clubs. And I want to restate something that was emphasized in the series kickoff. Right now, we're not concerned with how these sampling distributions are calculated. There's plenty of time for that later. Right now is big money time. We're looking for patterns, the really important things here, particularly how the shape and width of the sampling distribution change as the sample size increases. Probability sampling distribution of a sample uh, proportion of clubs in a theoretical sample of size 3. What about sample sizes 4, 5, and so we have an animation here. We're increasing our sample size. So what do we see here? Well, for one thing, the distribution seems to be centered at one-fourth, the vertical line, the population proportion. The distribution seems to have a sort of bell shape here happening, uh, and the distribution gets narrower and narrower as the sample size increases. And in this particular case, once we've sampled the entire population, we've sampled all 52 cards, what is the probability the ratio of clubs uh, will be one-fourth in our theoretical sample of the entire population? It must be one-fourth, probability one. When we sample the entire population, uh, the random variable sample proportion equals the population proportion with probability one. And we're going to pick this up in part three, and that's going to do it this time around. Thank you so very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to yet another installment of Quantslob. This is fourth in our basic application series. This time around, part three in our mini-series on probability sampling distributions. You recall uh, the gym game or workout program uh, from our installment on population parameters titled Population Proportions and Averages. This was the 13th edition in our foundational series, Lucky 13. Quick recap. This workout program involves a deck of cards. Uh, the idea is for some exercise. Say you're doing push-ups, you and your workout partner would each take turns doing sets. Uh, you would flip a card, and if the, if the card were a queen, say, that meant you uh, had to do 12 reps. Then your partner would flip the next card, and if he or she got, say, an ace, and they would do 14 reps, and you would each take turns until you had flipped all the cards. So that would be 26 sets each. Here is the sampling distribution of the average of the card integer ranks we just created for a sample size of 1, theoretical sample size of 1. This uh, graph is a histogram. Histograms are used to show the distributions of quantities. They're especially useful when the domain of quantities is large, that is, the number of possible values the quantity may take is large. Uh, in this case, of course, with the sample size of 1, the domain is simply the integers 2 through 14. But as the sample size increases, the domain of possible averages is going to increase dramatically. Uh, notice in the graph here, we have a thin vertical line that marks the population average of the attribute 8. Here is the sampling distribution of the average of the card integer ranks for a theoretical sample of size 2. And what we're going to do, as we have in the past, is animate this graph to show the sampling distribution for sample sizes, in this case, up to 26. And our goal is to look for a pattern as the sample size grows, particularly the width and shape of the distribution. And we see that it's centered at 8, has sort of a bell shape, and the distribution is getting narrower and narrower as the sample increases. This is uh, jumping way, way ahead here, but um, it, I want to spend a moment on this. Uh, if you were playing this gym game, just hypothetically, and you started with a well-shuffled deck of standard playing cards, would you be surprised uh, when you were done uh, if the average number of reps that you did per set, or should have done, uh, based on the card's integer rank value, was, say, 6 or less? Uh, and by the way, just in passing, if you're interested in learning about histograms, because there's a lot to them, the Wikipedia page and also mathisfun.com topic are both very good, I think. For another example, let's consider the infinite imaginary population of every possible toss of a coin. We're going to assert that the population parameter proportion of heads is precisely one half. We're defining it that way. So let's take a look at the sampling distribution of the proportion of heads in a theoretical sample of size 1. Uh, note we're back to using our line plot or line height plot to graphically show the distribution of these quantities here. 
Here is the sampling distribution of the proportion of heads in a theoretical sample of size 2. And as we have in the past, we're going to take a look at the probability sampling distribution animated for increasing sample sizes. This is going to be playing faster than in the past because we're going to count all the way up to a sample size of 500. What's the pattern? Uh, well, like in uh, previous examples, um, it's centered or appears to be centered at the population parameter 1 half. It's bell-shaped. It gets narrower as the sample size increases. If you have a very fine eye, a very fine eye, you'll notice that the rate at which the distribution narrows slows. You'll see here that the counter, the sample size counter, is rolling forward at a steady state, but the rate at which the distribution narrows slows, slower and slower. So finally, we get to 500. You can see, uh, in fact, uh, at this point, the rate at which it's narrowing is almost um, very hard to detect as the counter rolls up. To close out this edition, we're going to replay the previous animation, but with one difference. Here, we're dynamically changing the scale of the x-axis. Basically, and you can see this here, uh, we're progressively zooming in on the x-axis as the sample size increases. And this zooming or rescaling of the horizontal plot region we're doing here, and you can see that down there, is being done in a very particular mathematical way. And what do we see? In the previous version, we saw the distribution get narrower as the sample size increased. But here, the general shape appears virtually unchanging. And once again, if you have a very fine eye, you'll notice that the rate at which the abscissa or the horizontal axis is uh, expanding is getting slower and slower as the counter, the sample size counter in the animation increases. And that's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslob. This is fifth in our basic application series. This time around, part four in our mini-series on probability sampling distributions. I'm going to do a quick inventory here. Starting with our population comprising the 52 cards in a standard deck of playing cards, we looked at the sampling distribution of the sample statistic here, our proportion of cards suited as clubs in our theoretical sample. Um, as a reminder, we specified that the theoretical samples had to contain unique cards, no duplicates in the sample. Uh, in our examination, we learned that uh, at the limit, when we sampled the entire population, all 52 cards, the sampling distribution collapsed. So to say, uh, the probability that one-fourth of our sample is suited as clubs is one. No other proportions are possible here. And uh, just as an FYI, uh, probability distributions where one value, be it a quantity or a category, occur with probability one are sometimes called degenerate. Degenerate, like your little nephew that keeps putting the remote control in the fish tank. Again, with our standard deck of playing cards, we constructed an attribute, integer rank value of card. And we ran our animation up to a sample size of 26, and we saw this as the resulting sampling distribution of the average integer rank. Uh, we didn't show it in the previous edition, but had we sampled all the cards, our sampling distribution would be degenerate at 8. The population average, and I'm hoping that this is not a surprise to anyone at this point. We lastly looked at the uh, sampling distribution of the proportion of heads in an imaginary infinite population comprised of every possible toss of a coin. And at a theoretical sample size of 500 flips, uh, we arrived here at this probability sampling distribution. For this edition, uh, we're going to look at another example. We're going to consider the infinite imaginary population of every possible uh, spin and ball landing of a European European roulette wheel. Uh, and we're focused on two related attributes, uh, whether or not the ball lands on ought or green zero and the net winnings on a $1 straight wager on green zero. Here is the distribution in table form of the net winnings attribute in our population population distribution. We're going to create a sample statistic, the average net winnings, and here's the distribution of our average winnings in a theoretical random sample of size 1. 
The probability that we're going to lose a dollar is 36 over 37. The probability that we'll pocket $35 is 1 over 37. And once again, RV stands for random variable, random variable here. Showing the previous uh, table graphically, like we are here, brings something important to light. We have this huge mass. You can see it a probability at negative $1. And we've got this little blip of probability way out here at $35. In fact, it's at a short glance, it's barely visible in the graph. So I got this red circle here to sort of draw attention to it. We might describe this distribution as lopsided or skewed, skewed, as in skewed to the right. So what do we do next uh, on Quant's Law? Well, we animate, of course. Uh, we're going to see how the probability sampling distribution of our sample statistic average net winnings changes as the sample size grows. And we're going, to look at, we're going to do this by looking at a sequence of five short animations. In all five, we're going to be zooming in here. You can see it on the x-axis, just like we did with the coin tosses in the previous edition in this mini-series. This first animation, our sample size counter rolls us forward from 1 to 100. Uh, and here we are, sample size of 100. Uh, sort of bell-shaped, but uh, clearly lopsided um, or skewed. So in a sense, we see that even at a sample size of 100, this sampling distribution has inherited, so to say, some of the skewness we saw in the original parent distribution. So now we're going to roll forward from 100 to 1,000, but here by increments of 10, just to speed things up, keep things moving forward. And we arrive here at a sample size of 1,000. And if you're very sharp visually, if you're a very good visual person, you'll be able to detect that even here, at a sample size of 1,000, this distribution is very, very slightly skewed, but it's very subtle. Uh, we're going to roll, uh, keep going here. We're going to roll up to a sample size of 10,000, uh, this time by increments of 100. At a sample size of 10,000 here, now we've got uh, what appears to be a pretty symmetric and nicely bell-shaped distribution, um, at least visually as far as we can tell from the graph, uh, very much like we saw with the coin flips in the previous edition. And we're going to keep going here. We're going to keep rolling forward. Here, our counter is going to roll uh, roll us forward by increments of 1,000 all the way up to 100,000. And we arrive at a sample size of 100,000. Very nicely symmetric, bell-shaped. So one more. We're going to roll all the way up uh, by increments of 10,000 to a theoretical sample size of 1 million. 1 million. Theoretical sample size of 1 million. So here at a sample size of 1 million, very nicely bell-shaped, at least as far as my visual acuity can tell uh, from the graph. We've zoomed way in on our x-axis here, by the way. Uh, the width of our x-axis when we started was like $60. Um, here, uh, it's maybe six cents, the span of the x-axis. $60 is a thousand times more than six cents. And this actually means something. Um, one last thing, uh, notice how crowded our domain of values has become. Uh, in fact, uh, just in this very small region on this graph, this sample statistic can take on about 1,400 values, about, give or take. In other words, even though they're difficult to see in this plot, there are about 1,400 purple vertical lines here defining the mass of this distribution. And uh, that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. Always dearly appreciated. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslob. This is six in our basic application series. And this time around, we're going to close out our mini series on probability sampling distributions. If you have not already, I strongly suggest you check out the previous uh, installments in this mini-series. Just look for the uh, Probability Sampling Distributions mini-series playlist. Most people will have at least heard of the Central Limit Theorem and probably so too the Law of Large Numbers. These are two of the most celebrated uh, theorems or results, at least traditionally, in all of stats and data science. Um, and anytime a result is known universally, by its abbreviation, it's probably usually uh, pretty highly regarded. In stats and data science, if somebody says or writes uh, CLT, uh, everyone knows it means the central limit theorem and same essentially for LLN. Some of you may have proved as an exercise the CLT and or the LLN in an upper division math or stats course. Some of you may know very little about these two essential theorems and wish you knew more, rightly so.
Uh, well, uh, if you've enjoyed the previous four editions in the Sampling Distributions miniseries, you do actually know about the Central Limit Theorem and the Law of Large Numbers. Part of our job here in this installment is to bring together what we've seen and learned. Reflecting on our two examples involving infinite populations, we drew theoretical samples of increasing sample sizes from an infinite imaginary population of every possible toss of a coin and looked at the sampling distribution of the sample statistic proportion of heads in the sample. And we drew theoretical samples of increasing sample sizes from an imaginary infinite population of every possible spin and ball landing of a European roulette wheel and looked at the sampling distribution of the sample statistic average net winnings for a player on a $1 straight wager on green zero. And I want to stress that in this sampling distributions miniseries, our emphasis is on observing patterns visually. So in the following graphs, I want us to pay close attention to a couple of things. I want us to notice how the green path, and you'll see what I'm talking about here, more and more closely hugs uh, our sampling distribution as the sample size increases. The other is a little bit trickier, especially when the sampling distribution is lopsided, but it's true. The sampling distribution, that is the purple lines, balance, balance, like a seesaw on the true population parameter value, which is marked in our graphs by the tall, thin black line. Uh, coin toss is revisiting that. We looked at that in part three of this mini series. Here's the sampling distribution of a theoretical sample of one element. And you can see I've added the green path here. Sample size of 10, and again, the green path sort of follows the tops of the purple lines. Sample size of 100. Notice that the green path here seems to follow uh, the distribution, the tops of the purple lines uh, quite nicely. And a sample size of 500, which is sort of where we just left off. Uh, the green path hugs our sampling distribution very nicely. And here, all of these sampling distributions are symmetric here with the coin toss. So it's not difficult uh, for us to believe that the sampling distributions all balance balance on the thin black line here that marks the population proportion. Uh, we also considered uh, the imaginary population of every possible spin and ball landing of a European roulette wheel. The probability sampling distribution of our sample statistic average net winnings for a theoretical random sample of size 1 is lopsided or skewed as in skewed to the right. Here the green path uh, very poorly traces our sampling distribution However, it turns out that the distribution, the two purple bars, do in fact balance at the black line. You can see that the, even though you got a little blip way out here, it's exerting a lot of leverage. Here we are at a sample size of 100, um, sort of bell-shaped but clearly lopsided or skewed. At a sample size of 1,000, we notice the sampling distribution is still a little bit skewed. We can see this uh, green path pretty closely follows the tops of the purple lines. But uh, we can visually detect some imperfections in the way it traces the distribution there. 10,000 seems to follow the distribution much more closely. Uh, 100,000 more closely still. And finally, a theoretical sample size of 1 million. Uh, the green path very tightly hugs the sampling distribution. I mean, from the best we can tell visually. And because of the symmetry here, uh, it's not at all difficult to believe that the distribution uh, balances at the population parameter, the black line. Uh, defining the CLT can uh, be pretty technical. The central limit theorem states what we've been observing throughout this mini-series. As our sample size grows, the sampling distribution becomes symmetric and bell-shaped. Uh, the green path we were looking at is from a normal uh, or Gaussian distribution. And just as a technical note, um, I scaled its height because the normal distribution is defined over a continuous domain or continuous quantities, uh, and we are overlaying it on a discrete distribution. But our present goal here is to make uh, visual connections with what's happening. And we're going to be detailing, to be sure, continuous quantities and their distributions in immediately upcoming uh, installments here. Uh, if you will recall from our foundational series that a proportion is actually an average. It's an average of an indicator attribute. We touched on that way back in the foundational series. Recall also from our addition on probability that closed out our foundational series. One result of our theoretical samples is that the expectation uh, of a resulting quantitative random variable is precisely equal to the population average of the attribute values. And expectation is just a formal or fancy way of saying an average of a random variable. Uh, 
And it turns out that this implies that the expectation of our sample statistic here, sample average, is precisely equal to the population parameter. This critical mathematical truth is what we were observing here when we noticed that the sampling distribution balanced, so to say, on the black line that marked the, the uh, population average. So uh, like uh, so many Legos, we're going to assemble the law of large numbers. No matter what the sample size, the sampling distribution of the sample average will be centered at the true population average. We saw that as the sample size increased, the sampling distribution of the sample average became more and more narrow. This last ingredient uh, here concerning the Gaussian shape of the sampling distribution of the sample average is actually sufficient, but not necessary for the law of large numbers. It basically assures us that extreme values are not excessively likely, in so many words. Okay, here we go. As we get a larger sample, the sample statistic sample average will become a more precise estimator for the true population average. And by implication, the possibility that our sample average will miss the true average by some amount or worse becomes less and less probable as the sample size grows. And uh, one last thing here, because it's pretty important, uh, returning to roulette, uh, let's focus on the scale or span of the x-axis uh, of four of our sampling distributions from roulette. With a sample size of one, the span here, or if you prefer the range of the x-axis, is about $60 here. Um, with a sample size of 100 over here on the right, uh, the span of the x-axis is about $6. With the sample size of 10,000 here, um, the span of the x-axis is about $0.60, cents, if you can see that. With the sample size of a million, the span of the x-axis is about six cents. So we're going to put all this into a table. With a sample size of 100, the span of the x-axis is 10 times more narrow than the span of the x-axis for a sample size of 1. With a sample size of 10,000, the span is 100 times more narrow. Uh, with a sample size of a million, the span is 1,000 times more narrow. And so we see the pattern. It's shown here in the right column on the far right. The narrowness of our sampling distribution is related to the square root of the sample size. And this is no accident, and it's just not particular to roulette. It's not a coincidence. That is going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslob. There is an ancient proverb that I just made up today, in fact, that goes something like, the Quant Slob channel, about page, and discussion page are companions that will never let you down. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Every time I hear, hear that, uh, every the one time I've, I've heard that, I just get very emotional. This time around, part one of our mini series on continuous quantities, or if you prefer, continuous variables or continuous attributes. In the kickoff uh, to this basic application series, we considered some of the big conceptual tools on which data scientists and statisticians rely. In our earlier foundational series, among many other things we covered, we explored statistical populations. And just recently here in this basic application series in our sampling distributions mini-series we just concluded, we looked at some examples of probability sampling distributions and unveiled some really important and key patterns. The term continuous distribution is one of those terms that means exactly what it says. Uh, the trick or the challenge is to try and figure out uh, what it is saying. No analogy is perfect, of course, but I think I have something that works pretty well here for this edition. Imagine that we have six marbles uh, that are distributed, distributed among, say, four cups here. We have uh, two marbles in cup A, one in cup B, uh, none in C, and three in cup D. Um, I think that this is easy to look at. It's easy to think about. Um, for example, if someone asked uh, what proportion of marbles are in cup A or cup B, uh, 
uh, that is marbles in cup A and cup B combined, uh, not at all a problem, very easy to, to deal with. Uh, suppose now instead of marbles, we have water distributed among these four cups. As long as we can measure how much water is in each cup, this distribution too is uh, easy to work with. Uh, in the same spirit, uh, if uh, someone were to ask us like with the marbles, uh, what proportion of water is in cup uh, A or cup B, not at all a problem. Easy, easy to deal with, easy to look at, easy to work with. Uh, suppose now uh, that in the process of putting the cups away, one of the cups gets spilled. So the question here is, how do we describe the distribution of water here on the table surface? Clearly more challenging. And if someone were to ask us what proportion of water is residing on our side of the table, uh, you sort of get the idea. Certainly tractable, but you can see it's much different than having the water or marbles in cups. So we're going to connect the dots here on uh, this analogy or these analogies. Recall that if a population is finite, any attributes domain must be finite. The distribution of marbles and cups is analogous to an attributes distribution in a finite population. The cups are like the attributes domain values and the marbles are like the elements within the population whose attributes value take on the particular domain values defined by the cups. In the example uh, that we looked at, A, B, C, D. Uh, the distribution of water in cups is analogous to the distribution of an attribute with a finite do domain over an infinite population. Again, the cups are like the attribute domain values, uh, and the water is like the elements within the population whose attribute value takes on the particular domain values defined by the cups, just like with the marbles, A, B, C, D. The distribution of water on a tabletop is analogous to a continuous attributes distribution in an infinite population. Here, the continuum of the tabletop represents the attribute domain values, and the water is like uh, the elements within the population whose attribute takes on the particular domain values defined by their location on the table's surface. Make sure to check out part two of this mini-series. We're gonna pick things up uh, in part two of this mini-series. That is going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is eight in our basic application series. This time around, part two in our mini series on continuous quantities. As we saw in part one that we just concluded, continuous distributions arise when the domain of values for a quantitative variable or attribute is continuous, like a tabletop. In most settings, a continuous quantity will have an infinite domain. Now, we've already encountered infinity here on Quantslab, going all the way back to the foundational series. We considered imaginary populations with an infinite number of elements, and we survived that okay, I think. However, to fully harness the power of continuous distributions, we not only re-encounter infinity, but we need to manage it. Fortunately, the good news is that the theory of managing infinity in this way has already been taken care of for us. To enrich our understanding of what all this means, for this edition, we are going to embark on a veritable Homeric odyssey of some properties of numbers. Slight exaggeration. We're going to start with the uh, set of integers. The set of all integers is typically represented by capital Z here. Uh, usually, notationally, uh, we use blackboard bold typeface. It's not mandatory, but it's very typical. The Z comes from the German word Zollen, which is plural for Zoll, which means number, or probably a better translation is numeral. This is, I think, a pretty easy set to think about. It's basically all the whole numbers along with all the negative whole numbers. Or if you like fancy math talk, the set of integers is the union, meaning to bring everything together, of all the whole numbers and their additive inverses, so-called. Negative 3 is simply the additive inverse of 3. Now, the set of rational numbers here is typically represented by capital Q, again, usually in Blackboard Bold typeface. Uh, the Q comes from quoziente, meaning quotient, so named by the Italian mathematician Giuseppe Piano. This was maybe about a century ago, a little bit over. The set of rational numbers is made up of all the numbers that can be expressed as a ratio of integers. We exclude, however, division by zero, so the B here, the denominator, cannot be zero. Uh, 
To give us one perspective on infinity using the rational numbers, we're going to consider a property known as denseness. Imagine that someone is allowed to pick any two unequal rational numbers. Our job will be to find another rational number that sits between the two numbers. So just for an example, say someone chooses one fourth and one half. Both are rational numbers, they're different, unequal. Uh, so we'll choose, say, two fifths. Two fifths is greater than one fourth and less than a half. One more. Uh, someone chooses one over a thousand and two over a thousand. Again, they're both unique rational numbers. And so we'll choose, say, three over two thousand. And you can see where we're headed here. The set of rational numbers possesses this fascinating property that for any two different members, we can always find another member that sits between them, meaning that it's greater than one of them and less than the other. Uh, notice, uh, by the way, that uh, the set of integers does not possess this quality. So, for example, if uh, someone chooses the elements, say, 1 and 2, there is no integer that resides between them that is greater than 1 and less than 2. So the set of integers is not dense. Okay, back to the rational numbers here. The set of rational numbers, I think, offers a really fascinating window into infinity. Consider just the subset of rational numbers uh, between, say, 0 and 1. Um, this subset itself is dense, just like the larger set of all rational numbers. It therefore contains an infinite number of values. And I don't know, to me this is sort of amazing. There are an infinite number of ratios of integers in the unit interval, that is, between 0 and 1 inclusively. If it should please you, uh, it would please me greatly. Subscribe to this channel. Make sure to check out part three of this mini-series upcoming. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Really do appreciate it. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is nine in our basic application series. This time around part three of our mini series on continuous quantities. If you have not already, you may want to check out part one and part two, especially if you're doing uh, this as part of a lesson plan. Also, you may want to take advantage of our Quant Slob channel about page for information on ready-made playlists for your convenience, enjoyment, and edification. We're going to continue with our discussion of continuous quantities and continuous distributions, but we're going to do it by contrasting continuous distributions with something with which we're already somewhat familiar. So let's return to a, a familiar discrete distribution, the distribution of card rank in a population of 52 cards uh, comprising a standard deck of playing cards. Recall that we created here in the middle column uh, integer rank, an integer rank attribute. If you haven't seen our foundational series and you're seeing this for the first time, all we've done here is we've converted the card's uh, rank label value to an integer value. Uh, the idea is to simply convert the rank label to uh, quantity. Here is a distribution shown as a plot or a line plot. Um, and to be very clear, what we're doing here is we're simply describing the distribution of the integer value uh, rank in our population of 52 cards. There's no probabilities here. As we learn back in our foundational series in our probability edition, a theoretical random sample of a single element, a card in this case, from a population implicates a random variable from the attribute. The probability distribution is identical to the attributes distribution in the population. Now, this is admittedly a conceptual formality, but it's really important and it will save us a lot of grief down the road. So here we go. Uh, what we're looking at here is a so-called probability mass function, PMF for short, or actually more accurately, what we're looking at is a graphical representation of a probability mass function. We don't like looking at the plot. After all, I can't just assume people enjoy my line plots as much as I do. We can express this as a table. Um, just like the one we looked at a moment ago, except here uh, you can see that we have assigned on the far right column uh, each value of the domain to a probability as opposed to a proportion. So let's uh, just as an exercise make use of this uh, probability mass function. Let's call our integer rank uh, value random variable x. Uh, so what for example is the probability that x equals 10? The idea, of course, is that the PMF here uh, maps a value of the discrete random variable directly to its probability, explicitly to its probability. Um, and this may be getting a little ahead of ourselves, but just as another example, we can use our probability mass function to calculate the probability of a region of multiple values. 
So for example, what's the probability that X will be uh, greater than or equal to 10? Uh, this is a region of values and we can easily get to our answer simply by summing up all the probabilities associated with the values, five over 13. Okay, getting closer to continuous distributions now. I am thinking of a particular continuous variable and I want to convey this visually like we did with our discrete variable. Uh, and as we know well now, with uh, a variable with a discrete finite domain, we can often visually show the relationship uh, of domain values uh, to the respective probabilities with the table. However, a continuous variable has an infinite domain. This makes using a table to enumerate the domain essentially impossible, so tables out, at least as far as enumerating values explicitly. We also used a line plot, of course, which we just saw, uh, or a line height plot for variables with discrete finite domain. Uh, but if we try this with a continuous variable, we run into a handful of issues. Uh, first, we can't really plot an infinite number of purple lines here. The other issue is that if we think of our x-axis here, the abscissa, as being ordered, that is, numbers uh, to the right are greater than ones to the left, uh, if our domain is dense, and it is, uh, no matter what x1 and x2 are, uh, there are still an infinite number of domain values between them. So a line plot is out of the question. And so what do we do here? We're going to pick this up in part four. Uh, you're going to want to make sure to check that out, uh, part four of our Continuous Quantities mini-series. And that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you so very much for tuning in. Dearly appreciate it as always. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to, you know, the program, another installment of QuantSlob. This is 10 in our basic application series. This time around part four of our mini series on continuous quantities. If you have not uh, yet already, I would suggest you check out the first three videos in this mini series. You can also check out the channel about page for information about ready-made playlists. In our action packed previous edition, we left off the question of how to visually convey the relationship between a continuous random variable and the probabilities associated with its domain. Uh, because the domain of values a continuous quantity may take is infinite, it should be fairly intuitive that enumerating values using either a table or line plot, uh, as we've done in the past with uh, variables or quantities with a discrete and finite domain, simply doesn't make sense here. If, uh, if you will, allow me to introduce you to the so-called probability density function, or PDF for short. We're going to take a look at a couple examples here, but we're going to start with the uniform distribution. If x is a uniformly distributed random variable, then we can show its PDF thusly. Uh, there's obviously a lot going on in this plot here, but before we break things down and work with this a little bit, let's take a look at an equivalent representation using mathematical symbology. Uh, you will recall a uh, way back when in our foundational series during our discussion on math terminology and symbols, I mentioned that using symbols can make expressing things more compact and concise. Uh, here we go. This is quite an example of, of that. Uh, we're expressing the same function we were just looking at graphically uh, using symbols. Uh, what we're saying here is that the density function returns a value of 1 if the random variable is between 0 and 1 inclusively, otherwise it returns a value of zero. So let's go back to the graph here. Uh, how do we use this plot or this graph to find probabilities associated with the values of our random variable? The key, the key to this is that unlike with discrete quantities, we do not actually map domain values to probabilities. Rather, we map regions or ranges of values of our random variable to probability. The probability is the area or volume of the function cropped at the region or range of values of our random variable. So for example, uh, the probability that x is, say, greater than 1 half uh, is uh, equal to the area of the shaded region here that we have on the plot. Uh, I deliberately chose to start with the uniform distribution to make things easy to deal with, because calculating this area is pretty straightforward. The shaded region is a rectangle with a height of 1. You can see that. And a width of 1 half. The area of this rectangle is, therefore, 1 half. And hence, uh, the probability that a uh, random variable uniformly distributed over the unit interval is greater than one half is one half. One more, uh, just for practice. Uh, what's the probability our random variable will be between 0.4 and 0.6, or two fifths and three fifths, if you like ratios? So, here uh, in the similar spirit, we have a region that's a rectangle. Uh, this rectangle has a height of 1, just like in the previous example. Uh, this rectangle has a width of 1 fifth, so its area is 1 fifth. 
The probability our random variable is between 0.4 and 0.6 is therefore one fifth. Not too bad. Uh, so I think you know where we're headed here. The Gaussian or normal distribution. And what we're looking at here is a plot, path plot, of a standard normal probability density function. And I should point out that the term standard normal has historically had a couple different interpretations, uh, but nowadays the term standard normal refers to this distribution here. Uh, standard, as like an adjective, refers to a particular way of centering and scaling this distribution, the normal distribution. So what does that mean? Notice here that the peak, uh, also called the mode of the function, is over zero, directly over zero. And one more thing, uh, the area, for example, between negative two and two is uh, a particular number that happens to be a little bit over 0.95. Equiv equivalently, uh, the standard normal PDF is a normal PDF whose mean or expectation or average is zero and whose standard deviation is one. Note that the tails of the Gaussian distribution keep going. So the one uh, tail on the left here runs towards negative infinity and the one on the right towards positive infinity. Um, however, as we move farther away from the mode or mean, uh, the region of these tails becomes extremely fine. And to give a sense of this, the probability that our standard normal random variable is greater than 5, which is sort of to the right outside of the plot, is about 3 over 10 million. Uh, so it's a very fine, very fine slice. Uh, we always need to be careful when we use words like uh, always and never. Uh, we can, using the power of mathematics and a lot of unnecessary toilsome work, create counterexamples to these two assertions here, but the counterexamples would be way out of usual convention, uh, like showing up to a funeral dressed as a clown or something. You know, I guess if the funeral was for a clown, uh, dressing up as a clown to go to the service or funeral or might even be required. I don't have the answer to that one, but in any case, so we can pretty much hang our hat on these two statements here. Uh, the value returned by a probability density function will not be negative, that's the first statement, and the total area of the PDF equals one, that's the second statement here. On uh, the bottom equation, the second statement, uh, the symbol uh, that looks like a lazy S here uh, is called the integral symbol. Um, this is the first time we're seeing this here on Quant's Lab. If you will recall from part two of this mini-series, I mentioned that with continuous distributions, we need to manage, manage infinity. And this is basically what I was talking about. Integration is a powerful tool we can use to generally find the area of a function. If you're not familiar with integration, at this point, you probably shouldn't worry about it. Suffice that it's, uh, like we said, it's a technique for finding the area of a function. Uh, it's great to know calculus, but practically speaking, we can use software to calculate uh, our probabilities, and there are other resources we can use too. If you are familiar with integration, uh, you might be wondering or thinking to yourself, Aren't uh, these measures here uh, usually defined uh, for the real numbers? And the answer is yes, they are, which is precisely why we took a peek at integers and rational numbers in part two of this mini-series, although perhaps not for the reason uh, one might think. So we have some loose ends to tie up here. Uh, don't miss our mini-series finale, part five. And that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quantslob. This is 11 in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to close out our mini series on continuous quantities here. If you are a Quantslob power user, you will have noticed the capital I down there in the title section, and you will know that I stands for intermediate. This is the first Quantslob installment classified as intermediate to close out our discussion on continuous quantities. We're going to ramp up to some pretty geeky stuff here. So to keep track of the nerd factor for the first time ever here on Quantslob, we're going to break out the official Quantslob nerdmometer right there. Now I want to stress what we're looking at here is the official Quantslob nerdmometer. Okay, this is not one of those uh, cheap knockoffs that uh, we've all been hearing about. Okay, in the previous addition, we looked at a couple continuous distributions, including a normal or a Gaussian distribution here. And in both labeling the ordinate, that is the y-axis here, we had this dimension called density. So uh, what's density? If you've ever taken a physics class, you will have learned that physicists are absolutely cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs about units. Units as well they should be. Units are absolutely key.
and stats uh, not so much really and this is somewhat unfortunate I think uh, but if we're comfortable with units and we should be then this so-called density dimension is uh, easy to deal with it uh, turns out that density takes on units that are the inverse of the unit or units of the quantity or random variable so for example uh, if our quantity is in units say uh, meters then its density will be in units one over meters or units per meter if our quantity is in units meters per second like a velocity then its density will be in units seconds per meter uh, if uh, you happen to get the reference there in the uh, third example tip my hat to you uh, anyway, uh, we can think of a quantity's density as being a rate with respect to the units of the quantity, a rate with respect to the units of the quantity. If you're curious about how we know this, you're encouraged to leave a comment down there. Uh, ramping up the nerd factor here, strictly speaking, continuous distributions are usually thought of as being theoretical, and I mean this in two different ways. Uh, the first, I think, is pretty obvious. Um, a continuous variable is not empirical, meaning that it cannot present itself to us through a collection of data points. And this is obvious because there is no such thing, at least that I'm aware of, uh, as an infinitely large data set. Uh, the second uh, reasoning here is sort of out on the hinterlands of scientific thinking, and that is that there is a question if anything in nature truly possesses a measure that is continuous. Okay, so the takeaway here is that continuous variables and their distributions are idealizations. And they're idealizations that can be used to approximate or model a distribution of an attribute within some population. And by the way, this can uh, also be true of many discrete distributions and quantities, escalating the nerd factor here even more. In part two, of this mini-series, we encountered our buds, the rational numbers. We learned that the set of rational numbers is dense or densely ordered. Uh, any interval of rational numbers with positive length here uh, is also dense. As such, such collections contain an infinite number of elements. Rational numbers have a certain intuitive appeal, there's no question. Uh, anytime we write a number in decimal form, we are representing a rational number. Anytime a computer stores a numeric value in memory, it is representing a rational number. Because the set of rational numbers is dense, it is also regarded as continuous. It's a continuous set. It turns out, however, that uh, because the rationals are so-called disconnected almost everywhere, with respect to the reals, the Rational numbers do not define a so-called continuum. The set of real numbers, on the other hand, includes all the rationals along with all the irrational numbers. Numbers like the square root of 2, pi, uh, the base of the natural logarithm called e. Uh, just like the rational numbers, now the real numbers are dense. Okay, They're dense, densely ordered, dense in itself. But unlike the rational numbers, however, because a set of real numbers is everywhere connected, it does define a so-called continuum. In fact, the real numbers are sometimes simply referred to as the continuum. So this is important. Traditionally, when we encounter so-called continuous distributions or their associated continuous uh, variables, we assume that the domain is the real numbers. That is the union of all the rational numbers and all the irrational numbers uh, or some subset that is uh, closed within it. Uh, and when I say traditionally, I mean like deeply rooted in the theory of calculus and the theory of measure theory and set theory. And when I say deeply rooted, I mean like many decades and even centuries worth of roots. As a result, probability density functions are most always defined over the real numbers. Now, if this gives you a feeling that your intuition has been wrinkled, you are not uh, completely unjustified. We just got done appreciating that not only is a set of rational numbers infinite, but any interval of positive length contains an infinite number of values. We just talked about that. The set is continuous. However, common convention is to represent the distribution of rational variables as a probability mass function, which is discrete. Uh, so for this reason, and also considering that the domain of integers is infinite, an implication of this is that there may be occasions where it may be very challenging to graphically represent a quantity's distribution in a satisfactory way. Okay, so that's not a huge surprise, I don't think. The other consideration, I think, is much more nuanced here. Since the rationals are a continuous set, uh, we might naturally be tempted to express a distribution that's uh, over the rationals as a probability density function. However, uh, like we just said, the usual machinery of calculus 
that is finding the area of a distribution by integration doesn't uh, play out very nicely for us. So I'm going to suggest that there are two cases where we may want or need to have a domain defined over only the rational numbers. So uh, the first is that we may want to define an attribute that uh, quite simply is a ratio of integers. So I'll give you an example. Like, uh, for example, suppose that uh, our population is all the regular season completed NBA games over the last 10 seasons. We may want to create an attribute that is a ratio, say, of visitor total points divided by home team total points. Not at all a problem. The other uh, simply is maybe we just don't like irrational numbers. Maybe in childhood we had a bad experience. Maybe we got beat up by a bunch of irrational numbers uh, on the playground and we just don't like them. Completely our prerogative. Uh, in the first case, uh, to say this as simply as possible, it turns out that the mass function uh, may not possess the smoothness we would like to see or expect in a density function. In the second case, we have two options. Uh, the first and best option is to simply forgive the irrational numbers and model our attribute domain as a continuum of the real numbers. Otherwise, uh, really constructing measures over countable spaces is really not an issue. It's pretty trivial. Oh, I lost track of the official Quantslob nerdmometer. I think it's going to blow. Ah, ah, run for your lives. Ah. Uh, we're all goners, uh, the end of humanity, uh, 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 I'm just messing with y'all. If you made it through our Continuous Quantities mini-series, you are a true Slob Nation master. Nice job. And that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another one more not one fewer nor nor none more but rather one more another installment of quant slob and no <laughs> you are not dreaming this is 12 in our basic application series this time around we're going to kick off our long-awaited highly anticipated micro series on statistical hypothesis tests later on in this micro series we're going to uh, take a detailed examination uh, of the mechanics of performing a statistical hypothesis test. But what I want to do here in part one is consider some historical context. Appreciating and understanding the mechanics of modern statistical hypothesis testing is going to be a lot more natural with a little bit of historical perspective. Modern statistical hypothesis testing didn't just fall from the sky, didn't simply appear from within a vacuum, as the saying goes. So what I want to offer here is that the modern statistical hypothesis test is the product of an evolution of intellectual thought. Our perspective here, very condensed to be sure, takes us all the way back to some, as you can see, ancient antecedents. We're going to go all the way back to classical and Eastern thinking, and this may seem like a bit of a reach, but uh, I think that there is something here for us. We're going to consider the popular emergence of institutions of higher learning and the pursuit of systematic investigation. And we're going to consider some modern theories of learning. Uh, we're including these here not for their application to education, but for what they say or posit about how people learn. There's uh, obviously a lot to be said uh, about contrasting early classical thinking and Eastern thinking. But what they have in common, one overarching commonality lay certainly in the notion of higher truth and by implication the worthiness of its pursuit and that truth has order which in turn implies purpose throughout there is certainly the suggestion of attainability uh, or accessibility but the major similarity here that i want to point out is so obvious that it might be easy to miss for taking it for granted and that is simply the emphasis on critical examination. And uh, one way to say this simply is that uh, just because somebody feels like doing something or the village chieftain tells them to do something uh, does not necessarily mean it's the right thing to do. The emergence of higher learning institutions may even predate the classical and Eastern thinking we just looked at, perhaps going all the way back, uh, perhaps almost 3,000 years. Um, and we can also include here in this list, it's not here, the House of Wisdom, so-called House of Wisdom in Baghdad around the 8th century. Uh, we see here the ushering in of the second millennium, uh, saw the emergence of European universities. 
you know, including the uh, University of Bologna, known, of course, as we all know, for their world-class College of Lunch Meat Studies. The importance here is not just the centralization of information, okay? Uh, libraries provide for that. More importantly, uh, with centralized instruction comes a more uniform, cohesive narrative. And sure enough, uh, doesn't take very long, we see this uniformity play out in more systematized approaches to understanding natural phenomena. Throughout this whole timeline, of course, we have the development of mathematics, and mathematics is, of course, a global phenomenon. At some point, uh, I might create a topical video dedicated to this, but I'll mention it here briefly because it's kind of interesting. The archaeological record uh, seems to indicate that games of chance are virtually prehistorical. They found dice, dice like uh, modern dice, that uh, date back like 5,000 years. And maybe the word mystery here is a little bit too strong, but it's certainly something of a curiosity that despite this deep history of gaming, uh, that there doesn't really appear to be any record, an ancient record anyway, anyway, of anyone attempting to fashion some mathematical description of games of chance, no suggestion of probability or the idea of sample spaces. And it wasn't until maybe the 1500s where we start to see glimmerings of the application of math to games of chance. Okay, now here we are in the modern era, we see the emergence of psychology. Uh, the, oh, and many theories concerning how people learn or acquire and apply knowledge. And I want to stress here, like I did at the very beginning, that we're looking at behaviorism, constructivism, uh, cognitivism for what they say about learning, not for their application to education. And uh, we're not really interested either here in uh, speculating on the underlying mechanics. We're focused on the theories or conjectures in and of themselves. That's our area of focus here. And uh, many of you will be aware that there have been some, shall we say, disagreements between behaviorists and constructivists. But in any case, there is a close similarity between constructivism and cognitivism here. One could say uh, that constructivism is a uh, contextual-based flavor of cognitivism. For our purposes here, however, ultimately they both theorize that we gain knowledge by generalizing experience. And if we're bold, uh, we can throw all of this stuff uh, up into a big pot, crank up the heat, and arrive finally here at a synthesis of modern statistical hypothesis tests. What do we have in no particular order? A willingness to challenge the status quo. Big. An understanding that we may only have incomplete and, importantly, variable information. And we also, of course, require a uniform, universally applicable and theoretically meaningful technique. Make sure to check out this entire micro series. If it should please you, it would please me greatly. Subscribe to the channel. That's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to another another installment of Quant's Lab. This is Lucky 13 in our basic application series. This time around, we're gonna continue on with our introduction to statistical hypothesis tests with part two of our micro series. You will notice the subtitle, Two Ways to Be Wrong. Allow me, if you will, uh, to regale you with a little story. It's uh, kind of a silly story, but uh, it uh, works, I think, pretty well for our purposes here. Some years ago, uh, I was out with a group of friends and uh, we were just going out uh, checking out some uh, bands at a nightclub. And uh, to help you experience the following events to bring everything to life here, I prepared this photo recreation of the group of us. Uh, you can see me there on the far right. If you're paying very close attention here now, you'll notice uh, I'm using teddy bears here. Uh, and I'm using teddy bears because I found out that uh, hiring human actors, um, models, uh, can be prohibitively expensive. but Interestingly and fortuitously, teddy bears, it turns out, will work for free. They apparently have a very weak union. So we're outside this club with quite a few others waiting to get in. And a couple of our group, it turns out, were like friends of friends, so I kind of didn't know them all that well. As we're waiting to go in, uh, some dude off in the distance kind of waves at me or waves in my direction. And so for reasons I will make clear, hopefully, at the end of this video, I uh, do one of these, I wave back. Well, as you can guess, uh, dude was not waving at me or anyone in our group. Uh, and uh, I recall that uh, one person in our group uh, became somewhat embarrassed by... Uh, my wave back misfire, shall we call it. 
Interestingly, on that night, uh, just uh, so happens that a close friend who was with us explained why I waved back. So we're going to break everything down here, okay? If someone waves in our direction, they're either waving at us or they're waving at someone else. So now we have two possible courses of action and response here. We can either wave back or not wave back. So now you can see here we've got this nice uh, two by two table. Uh, we can call this an error table, error table, or sometimes it's called a confusion table. We're going to use this error table to illustrate how our predictions match reality. But I want to spend a moment clarifying what it is we're looking at here, offering a little bit of detail. We have two factors. One is called simply actual. We can also call this ground truth. Ground truth is either is one word or two words. Uh, there's a whole story behind that, maybe for a video at a future date. But in any case, this factor has two levels or categories represented as rows here. This factor defines underlying truth. The other factor is our prediction here. This factor also has two levels or categories. These are represented as columns here. This factor defines our prediction. So let's examine our space of possibilities. We have four possibilities here. If we wave back to someone uh, who is waving at us, that would be a good match, our prediction matched reality. If we ignore someone who is waving at somebody else, that too is a good match. Uh, however, if we uh, wave at someone who is not waving at us, then that would be an error. Uh, if we don't wave back because uh, we have predicted we are not being waved at when in fact we are, this too uh, would be an error. Now, I don't want to get all negative here, but uh, we need to focus on the two errors we have here in the table. In particular, we want to differentiate these two types of errors. Differentiating or categorizing these two types of errors that will appear in a confusion table is actually a really important part of the thinking behind statistical hypothesis testing. It's also important in many other scientific settings, so it's worth taking a look at here. There is a very well-defined taxonomy for categorizing these two types of errors, or these two errors. Classifying the two errors can sometimes be subjective, as we're going to see. We're going to look at the most direct way to classify these. We're going to look at the actual factor. We can think of each of these two statements or categories as being conjectures about reality. Whichever of these two we consider the default or the status quo or as being passive or requiring no response, we will call in the language of statistical hypothesis testing the null hypothesis here, the null hypothesis. We're going to look at uh, many examples of null hypotheses later in our basic application series and beyond. But just as we said, uh, there can be subjectivity or at least context dependency in identifying the null hypothesis in this way. So for example, for a famous celebrity, when someone waves in their direction, uh, they may uh, likely be waving at them. They probably are. So that would be the default. But we're just going to go with our original null hypothesis here moving forward. When we make an error against the null hypothesis, we have committed a so-called type 1 error. It's also called a false positive. False positive. False because we made an error. Positive because you can see here this error may have promoted unwarranted action. In this case, a wave back. By the way, there's another way to describe why, why it is we use the term false positive, but it involves slightly more complicated logic. Uh, conversely, here now, uh, when we make an error against the other hypothesis or the alternate hypothesis, we have committed a so-called type 2 error, which is also called a false negative. False negative. False, uh, again, uh, because we have made an error. Negative, because here our incorrect prediction has negated an appropriate response here, potentially anyway. So we're going to bring everything all together here. Let's bring it on home. If there is any uncertainty in whether or not someone is waving at us, uh, the official Quantslob wave back policy is to simply wave back. Why is that? So to understand what we're going to do here is we want to consider the consequence or cost associated with these two distinct errors. If we erroneously wave back, uh, then here, uh, potentially socially awkward to some degree. Uh, however, if we don't wave back to someone who is in fact waving at us, then we will be potentially snubbing a friend or someone who is trying to be friendly. The Quantslob cost function assigned to each of these two types of errors is thus. Uh, snubbing a friend, false negative, comes with a much greater cost than some small amount of personal social awkwardness, false positive. So says 
quant slob. Make sure to check out the rest of this uh, micro series. If it should please you, it would please me greatly. Subscribe. And uh, that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in. And don't forget to stay tuned for more Quant Slob. Greetings and welcome to another installment of Quant Slob. This is 14 in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to power on with our introduction to statistical hypothesis tests micro series with part three. Very simple agenda for this video. Two themes related to statistical hypothesis tests some recent history and context, and of course the answer to the timeless question, what do it do? Uh, anyone who has looked at a number of different uh, sources regarding statistical uh, hypothesis testing will have noticed uh, the rather wide variety of different perspectives on the subject. Some of this variety, uh, euphemistically, has resulted from the ripple effect of some rather passionate conflict in the early, maybe mid 20th century by a number of prominent figures. So the wavy lines are supposed to be ripples. Some of the variety has simply arisen uh, from different requirements within different uh, applications from different uh, scientific disciplines. For the short term, uh, at least in our upcoming installments of this basic application series where we will feature examples of statistical hypothesis testing, the view we're going to favor is like so right here. Uh, data driven, certainly a point of view that is going to appeal to data scientists and aspiring data scientists alike. Uh, basically, this means that the insights that we may gain about some population by testing are provided exclusively through the data that has been realized from the population, like a sample. Uh, simple enough. What is meant by decision process? Well, uh, very simply, that so called statistical tests are really a special case of decision processes. That is, the concepts and techniques of statistical testing really belong uh, to the larger discipline of uh, decision theory. Uh, now, I know some true-blooded statisticians may not like this hierarchy, but the reason I particularly like it is because if something goes wrong with one of our tests, uh, we can simply blame the decision theorist uh, whose office is just down the hall. Yeah, we shouldn't do that. Uh, but this is not a humility contest. Uh, most all the important innovations in statistical testing are owed to great statisticians. But it is very convenient and accurate, I think, to regard these innovations as falling under decision frameworks. Okay, inferential induction. Okay, what does that mean? Well, uh, we've used the word uh, induction uh, before here on Quantslob. We're using it now, and we will surely use it again. We observe and measure elements that are examples coming from within a larger unobserved population. Uh, from the properties or features of these examples, we learn or gain information about features within the larger population, uh, even though we have not observed the whole population. This is an example of induction. Uh, inference, because we can utilize what we've learned about the population to draw conclusions, make conclusions. Performing a statistical hypothesis test is a form of inferential induction. Okay, so now, what do it do? Uh, well, we've already suggested some of this. Uh, in the more broad context of hypothesis tests, generically, uh, we can use our observations to talk about the relative likelihood that different conclusions or courses of action will be correct. For example, we can use data to simply determine which of two choices is, simply said, better. Uh, this example uh, illustrates the classic fork in the road scenario. We're going to make a choice, and we simply want to know which uh, is more likely to lead to better results. Uh, absolutely nothing wrong with this. Much more interesting, and what is usually implied when people speak of statistical hypothesis tests, is the significance test, which, as we saw earlier, should be regarded as a special case of the more generic hypothesis test. The idea here is that if our data provides a sufficiently high threshold of certainty uh, regarding the correctness of a hypothesis, we are ready and willing to change our beliefs. The reason significance tests are such a scientific breakthrough is because in many settings we already have an established way of doing something or an assumption about how something is behaving. But if there's a better way to do something, or if that something isn't behaving the way we think, we want to know about it for sure, but we simply need to be convinced. Uh, we're willing to change the status quo but because in many settings doing so may be disruptive, to use a modern corporate term. We need evidence. Make sure to check out the rest of this micro series. If it should please you, it would please me greatly. Subscribe to Quant Slob.
that's it. That's going to do it this time around. Thank you very much for tuning in, and don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob. Greetings and welcome to yet another installment of Quantslob. This is 15 in our basic application series. This time around, we're going to close out our introduction to statistical hypothesis tests micro series. Like in the previous edition, part three, a very simple agenda this time around. We've been tossing around this term feature, so what's that all about? And with significance testing in mind, we're going to look briefly at statistical hypotheses. Much of the background here we've covered uh, already on Quantslob in the foundational series. The foundational series, highly recommended. It's already been playlisted for your edification and convenience. So we have a collection of observations, a sample or a data set, and a larger population from which our sample was somehow realized. A feature or value that is constant across our population we call a parameter. From our sample now, or data set, we may calculate a sample statistic. Our sample statistic will be calculated from our sample in such a way that it may serve as an estimator for the population parameter. So to offer a couple very simple examples of this, we may use a sample average of some quantitative attribute to learn about the average of this attribute within the larger population from which the sample was realized. We may analogously use the sample proportion of a category to learn about the proportion of this category within the larger population. By the way, in the context of this sort of relationship between our estimator and parameter, our parameter is sometimes called an estimand here. Soon upcoming here in this basic application series, we will be detailing the tactics of executing statistical significance tests. We're going to be working through several examples. Here, to close out this introductory micro-series, we're going to sketch out the look and feel of statistical significance test hypotheses. So we have two hypotheses. Both hypotheses should always be hard and fast mathematical statements about our parameter of interest. The null hypothesis, H null, is a mathematical statement about our parameter that represents the status quo, the default, uh, or if you prefer the conventional wisdom, uh, or it could be something that is simply passive or neutral about our parameter. Let's move it along. Nothing to see here. Uh, don't trip potato chip. Sometimes on the, on the streets, uh, we also like to call our null hypothesis the uh, you ain't got nothing coming hypothesis. I just made that up, but it, it actually sort of works in a way. Uh, okay, so the null hypothesis is a mathematical statement about our population parameter. So what kind of statement for a single valued parameter, say, for example, if we're looking at the average of some quantitative attribute of our elements across our population, we often like to see strict equality in our null hypothesis. More broadly speaking, and in much more advanced terms, the null statement often defines a boundary or a partition here in our so-called parameter space. And we'll talk more about this later. This is more advanced. It's a more advanced idea here. Uh, the other hypothesis uh, we call our alternate hypothesis, or HA or H sub A. As the name suggests, alternate is a statement that is in opposition to the null hypothesis. In some circles, the alternate hypothesis is aptly called the research hypothesis. While we may think of our null hypothesis as reflecting the status quo or norm about a parameter, our alternate hypothesis will reflect a space of parameter values that is in opposition to the null or a status quo. Which region of our parameter space? Well, whatever is relevant or of particular interest with whatever research we happen to be conducting or whatever sort of investigation. For example, uh, suppose we're studying the population of living, breathing narwhals, and we're interested in learning about the proportion that are psychedelic and code Haskell. Well, I think we'd all be rather astonished if the proportion of narwhals that are psychedelic and can write any sort of computer code, let alone Haskell, were any number other than exactly zero. Uh, by the way, we really don't need a statistical test here because if we observe just uh, one living, breathing, psychedelic uh, Haskell coding narwhal, we can reject the null hypothesis with perfect certainty. Uh, the null in this particular case uh, is, uh, so they say, empirically falsifiable, so that should keep all, all of our fun-loving positivist friends happy. And if you do find a living, breathing, psychedelic narwhal that codes Haskell, you, my friend, are definitely getting published. And you can just list uh, Quantslob as a co-author. I got no problem with that. Immediately, uh, immediately upcoming in our basic application series, we're going to look at sampling and revisit distributions. And we're going to resume with a number of installments dedicated to working through
statistical hypothesis tests. And this time around, that's going to do it. Thank you very much for tuning in. Don't forget to stay tuned for more Quantslob.